the magic in leadership is being able to open an organization up to realize exactly what they're capable of and imagine a future that is different than where we are now and finding yourselves taking steps towards it. Welcome to Speaking of Business, conversations with Canadian innovators, entrepreneurs, and business leaders. I'm Goldie Hyder, President and CEO of the Business Council of Canada. Some of you know that I grew up in Alberta. Living in a prairie province, I developed a great appreciation for the vastness of our country. I watched long trains travel west with Canadian goods bound for foreign shores. I watched equally long trains travel east with imported products heading to other parts of the country. You know, watching a train is like watching Canada's economy in action. A train is an integral link in our complex supply chain. Many of those trains are operated by CN, Canada's largest railway. The company is more than 100 years old, operating 30,000 kilometers of track throughout Canada and the United States. And today, the responsibility for operating that vast and complex network falls on the shoulders of President and CEO Tracy Robinson. No pressure there. I'm delighted to be at CN headquarters in Montreal today to speak with Tracy. Welcome to the podcast, Tracy. Goldie, any time for you. Let's dig right in. You know, we're talking in downtown Montreal at CN headquarters in February, I'm six degrees. A year for you almost. A year indeed. And by the way, it's way warmer this year than it was last year. This Yeah, year. well, we'll come to that because that's obviously an important issue. It's not something we should necessarily be celebrating. But um, let's talk about the year that you've had. Um, you know, you're a Western Canadian like, like I am. You're from University of Saskatchewan. I'm from Alberta. You're out in Quebec now. You're the CEO of the railway, and big footprint, largest railway, and largest in, in terms of your distribution and so forth. How's it going? How are you doing? It's going well. I have the best job in the world from my vantage point. You know, it, being here in Montreal is fantastic, but this network that we have at CN goes all the way across the country from Vancouver and Prince Rupert on the, on the west to Halifax in the east and down to the Gulf Coast in the south. So, you know, I come home every day to Montreal here. But during my day, I'm out either physically or, or literally across um, all the parts of the continent. And that's a privilege to be part of so many different businesses. So loving it. Anything surprised you so far? You know, I had um, stepped away from the industry for eight years. I spent a lot of years in the railroad industry at the first part of my career, stepped away. And as I came back, what was nice is that there was a lot that was familiar. But the thing that I noticed that was most different and most surprising was how significantly the technology side of the business has advanced. Many people look mm. at trains and they don't think about technology. Yeah. But the application of the uh, use of data, the application of the use of other uh, technologies to be able to anticipate is significant. If you think about rails, and we now have lasers that will look at things that we couldn't possibly see, issues around rail, whether it be brakes or other other abnormalities has decreased 90% in the last 20 years. And that's technology. And that's, we're just starting on that. What's ahead of us is is stunning and pretty exciting. Let's stay with that topic because uh, I often hear leaders say that every business today is on a journey to becoming a technology company. Mm -hmm. But the perception of railway is, you know, your old economy. How does a railway become a technology company? What are you doing? What are you seeing? And as you said, it's early days in terms of modernization and innovation in this industry. It runs the full spectrum. So we still have trains that run down tracks and then the, that's the most visible part of our business. But supporting that is an array of data and systems and capabilities that can not only monitor the quality of the track, of the ballast, of the undercarriage. It can pick up the heat of the wheels that are going across a, a sensor. It can pick up through laser early indications of defects. So the impact on, you know, the safety of our operation has been significant. But as importantly, the impact on our ability to perform as part of a larger supply chain uh, and the need for us to all be really resilient about that has improved significantly. And as we look out into the future, that capability to sense what's going to happen, to be prepared for it and to prevent it is going to be critical. 
But our ability to communicate data across integrated supply chains Mm -hmm. is what really is exciting about the future of how we think about global supply chains. I know we're probably going to talk about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I was um, with with the CEO of WestJet, a member of the BCC, last week, and he was talking about how, you know, you get a lot of attention on the airlines, but there's a supply chain issue here that works from airports and from security and from other things. How is it in your business uh, where you're really not people movers, mm-hmm. right? It's product movers. How are you finding the the the, part, the system, the link, the chain working? Where are the gaps that we can make this industry stronger? Oh, it's the same in our business as it is in uh, in Alexis's business. So we are one part of a much broader supply chain. If you think about, you know, all the globalization that's taken place mm-hmm. in the last thirty years, that has required uh, the development of really, really integrated supply chains. So if you are producing something, you know, at a production facility. You may touch rail, that may be transferred to a truck in a warehouse, or if you're reaching into global markets, it's a port or a terminal and it's vessels and another terminal on the other side. And the supply chain really only functions as the sum of the parts as we look at it. So it goes well when it goes well, but, you know, if there's a problem or an issue or a shock, to any one of the pieces of the supply chain, it can impact the performance of, of the whole. Very much the same case it is when you're moving people. Mm. You mentioned ports. Canada is, of course, a trading nation. It is. We have to get a lot of product out to market. Are we keeping up with our capacity to export as we look forward in terms of demand for energy, demand for critical minerals, demand for food? The opportunity is significant for Canada. We have this gift (laughs) of resources and the gift of capabilities. And as a country, we're part of a much bigger global economy. And, you know, we're performing and have performed over time in that, but the opportunity for us to step up to the next level is huge. And I I would argue that it's a requirement. It's a demand for us to step up to the next level. Whether it is the export of our natural resources, whether it's the import of consumer goods, you know, if, if we look at it, this from our system, about a third of our, of our business is around products that are moving globally, either coming in through ports or leaving through ports in the west coast of this country, in the east coast, or down on the gulf coast. Uh, you know, about a third of it travels back and forth across the Canada-U.S. border, and the rest of it is local within markets within Canada, the United States. But in all of those cases, as Canada, we need the supply chains to be effective, highly performing, and resilient. Uh, Things are moving quickly. Trade flows are changing quickly. And if we want to be able to participate in the way we know we can as a country, we need to be able to to move with it. You know, some say that if it wasn't for the fact that we built the arteries of this country over a century ago, we probably couldn't do it today. I think that's true. What does that say about us? It's frightening. Right. So I've spent my career in in, um, around big infrastructure building and operating it, whether it's energy infrastructure, whether it's it's railroads. And it is the heart, not only when we, when we first started to build this country, of settlement and, and of building our first economies, but it's also what allows our economy, Canada, North America, to function and gives it the prospect for growth. And if we can't find a way in this country to be able to create some certainty and some predictability into how we operate our infrastructure and how we expand our infrastructure, how we finance it or attract capital markets to that, then we are going to miss a good chunk of the opportunities as we look forward. If we think about the lost opportunity in supply chain of uh, LNG of some of the energy products of the last 20 years, if we look at that lost opportunity and what we, the time... How quickly it it could be come and gone within six months. Exactly. And, you know, the time period it takes us to determine as a country, as a government, as a regulator, whether or not we want to step into those things, the market could have passed us by. It's good only if we learn from the experiences of the past. We've got an opportunity to step up. We need to get organized around how to do it. I've often said that these infrastructure issues are really potentially about sovereignty, it's the capacity for you to control your own destiny of selling your own goods to the markets that you choose to. Now, obviously, you operate in the United States as well. I think your 22,000 employees are spread all over. Uh, do you find it easier there? In some ways. I think every jurisdiction has its unique problems. And, you know, you have to come at it through the lens of, of solving unique solutions. And 
in Canada, we need to understand that our gifts and natural resources and capabilities, we're a very, very large country. Uh, if we can't rely on the access to our infrastructure, you know, we will become a very small country before very long. Okay, let me go back to where I wanted to start with you, which is that experience of being a Western Canadian and, and now here in Quebec, uh, and one who, as you said, travels extensively. How do you feel about our country? How do you feel about where we are? And how do you feel about how, the opportunity for us to compete in the world? It's a privilege to be in a position in, in which I travel a lot because you get to see all parts of Canada, but different parts of the continent as well. And you know, we have... We've got a great thing going in Canada. I would say those of us who live here, were born here, we've won the geographic lottery in some regards. Our country, where we have great resources, we've got great capabilities, and we're also a, a country and a community. It's almost hard to screw it up, some would say. <laughs> it is, but, you know, we care. You know, we care about each other. We care about the communities. We care about how we do it. And I think that that can be a great asset and should be part of our selling feature. We still have to find a way to make it work every day. And I think that's our greatest challenge and our biggest opportunity. So I'm proud to be Canadian. I'm proud to be a country that thinks hard about the how we come to our work in, every day into the world. But I want to be part of a country and a community that's really good at doing it well. Uh, we have to get it done. And we've lost a bit in the pausing of thinking through that. We need to find a way to step into it. So what, what is it that's holding us back? Oh, that isn't that the question. If we could answer that one simply and we could fix it simply. I think that we have aspirations to advance into our future in the right way. We have not yet done the work in the detail of that to figure out how exactly that works as we develop our infrastructure and economy. So no one can argue with the broad principles that we're having discussions on in this country. The question remains is, are we willing to do the work on what that means when it comes to an actual project or economic opportunity, you know, where those two meet each other in a way that benefits all of us? So if you look around the world, many countries are now seized with this sort of um, notion of what's our industrial policy? Mm. What do we want to be when we grow up? And as you said, we won the geographic lottery. Mm -hmm. It's kind of easy to be Canada mm -hmm. uh, in many ways. But if we could start charting the course towards that industrial policy, what do you think we should be aspiring to and how? So as lucky as we are to be Canadian, we're a very, very large company, a country rather, and companies too, like and companies we want to keep too, them and we industries. Help them grow. Like in, in, in those industries are important to us, but they need to come to bear in the right way. And as a country, that's what the question is: is how do we bring that to bear? We have to live in a global economy, and as we talk about climate, we live in a global environment. And so, when we think about where we're going and what we want to do, how we organize ourselves, more of it needs to be through that global lens. Well, you would think that. Of all the places in the world, Canadians would be well situated to do that. Uh, outside of Indigenous people, every one of us traces our roots back to somewhere else. Exactly. And we have this culture where we all want to help. And that fits perfectly. And we happen to have resources and capabilities, but resources that the world needs, whether it be agriculture. You know, we feed the world from this country, whether it be energy products and the way that we develop our energy products to the highest environmental standards in the world, right? The world needs those. So we need to think about how we operate as part of a much bigger global community, whether it be economic or whether it be climate, environment. We are part of a much bigger community and we can be a much more important part if we step into it. Now, as, as you, you know, the Business Council of Canada, we're really of the view that there are sort of three strategic advantages to being Canadian. One is we're a very welcoming society for talent, for people. Our history is of that. Uh, two is um, the, the, the natural resources that we have. We call it power, but all the resources, whether you're talking hydro or forestry or agriculture or oil and gas, whatever the case might be. And then the last one really is proximity to the United States of America. So I want to ask you, given that you're also operating in the United States, how do you feel about our relationship, Canada-US, and, and sort of where are the opportunities as we look at a government in America that's extremely aggressive on attracting both talent and capital mm -hmm. with the Inflation Reduction Act? How do we respond? 
Well, we need to respond. Firstly, you know, this is a very competitive world. And we are competing whether we like it or not. The United States is our friends, they're our brothers, they're our neighbors, and we are part of each other one way or another. And we're more alike than different in some ways, but we compete with them, as you say, whether it's for capital, whether it's for labor, whether it's for markets, uh, whether it's for industries. What we want, I think, if I could speak on behalf of the industries in Canada, is a level playing field. And I think after we get a level playing field, we can compete and we will be there and we will step into the potential of this country and every industry in this country as we do that. And so that is the, you know, that's the conversations we need to have is what does a level playing field look like and how do we get there? Hallelujah. I have heard that from everyone saying if there's one thing Canadians can do, it's not just, you know, compete in sports, but compete in business and in every other walk of life. And some ways we need almost that um, own the podium attitude in business. What are we really good at? Where are the gold, silver, and bronzes available to us? And there's an idea. That there's how we should structure it. Well, that's it, worth trying. Yeah. Um, you talked about, and we touched on it, and I wanted to spend a little bit more time uh, returning to the topic of climate change. Mm-hmm. The issue of our time, COVID aside, this is really the biggest existential threat to our society globally. Talk to me about what CN is doing and what part it's playing in that. As I come into this company, I would say it's been another impressive feature of, of how the thinking has evolved over the past. We started down this path a long time ago, and so we are well into a program towards net zero. We've reduced our you know emissions intensity by 43% since 1993. Uh, and you know it's really just begun. We also have the privilege of being part of an industry that in itself is part of the solution. So we are very, you know, emissions friendly if you think about the options around transportation, you know, relative to trucks and other forms of transportation. Even on day one, uh, you know, there are a lot of advantages to rail in that regard. But when you think about how we step into the future as a railroad, 85% of our emissions come from locomotives and come from the propulsion. So there is a great future out there in new forms of propulsion that will be, you know, emissions light or emissions free. As we move towards that, you know, the first step is, you know, our fuel efficiency, basically how you drive a locomotive, the same as how you drive a car. And we've made great strides. That's largely what's behind the 43% improvements, the way that we run our our system and our locomotives. Uh, We're the best in the business, the best in North America by about 15% on fuel efficiency. Then we're starting to blend some of the fuels with biodiesels and renewable diesels. Beyond that, we're all experimenting with what's that next level of propulsion, what will fuel the locomotive of the future. And we're experimenting with electricity. We're experimenting um, as an industry with hydrogen fuel and cells, fuel yeah. cells. Yeah. We will find that. And as an industry, for road locomotives, there's really only one choice. We have to make the same choice, whatever it turns out to be, because we're very collaborative and integrated industry. So if I you know, have a train that departs from Montreal and goes down to Chicago and beyond, that locomotive is going to be riding on somebody else's railroad. So we have those agreements in place. So we need to make the same decision, all of us. And that's out there. I'm not sure yet what it's going to be, but there's lots of work going on. But it's not a waiting for that day. We're all moving towards much greater levels of, of um, fuel efficiency and emissions reduction. Where did the customer fit into all of this? I mean, we saw in Europe the experience where they moved almost too soon, too quickly with renewable. Mm. Gas prices went shooting up. And they said, look, I can't afford it. And on came coal plants. Like, how do we make sure that we bring the public with us on this? And they understand that they have to have some skin in this game, too. We think of customers in a couple of ways. One is that our customers are the industries, firstly. And so they are all going down this path themselves. So as we all expand our thinking from scope one to scope two to scope three, we're working in a much more integrated way with our customers on these things around what is the fewest miles they can travel when they when they need you know to use a supply chain. They care about the fuels that we burn, so we're becoming even more integrated, more integrated. from that perspective. Right. But the customer at the very end is me, and I pay. But the consumer, yeah, the consumer, and, yeah. and all of this comes at a cost. But the one thing that we've learned through the pandemic. And through all the uncertainties that have followed that, whether it's the unrest in Europe, whether it's the question now of what's the future of globalization, nearshoring, how strong is the economy, are we in a recession and what does that look like, what is the future of labor markets, as we think about all of that, you know, we need to come together in a different way. But it's testing the reliability and the reliance of supply chains. And I think the resilience factor 
is more front and center in everyone's mind than it ever was before. Are we going down a path that is resilient and that we can stick together? And I think, I think we're having different conversations, even as consumers, than we had before. I struggle asking this question because it's very leading, um, <laughs> and I don't know how else to say it, but what is it about our culture that there is a sense of comfort and complacency that there isn't the urgency or the ambition that you're speaking of right now? Goldie, I don't know how to answer that question. I, we, when you grew up in the West like I did, I don't did. you feel there's a real sense of entrepreneurialism and a get-her-done kind of attitude? And, well, there and is. I, there. Mean, I grew up with a, on a family farm in Saskatchewan. And, you know, how your world went, how your day went, how your, your future went depended on how hard you worked. And that's the kind of community that we grew up around. And you cared about everything. Maybe we've come to a time where it's not as difficult as I said, it's a bit leading because what yeah. I see as I travel around the world is a lot of ambition with a lot of urgency attached to it. And, and I, you think that we don't have that? I, I'm cons- well, certainly not relatively. Yeah. <laughs> certainly not relatively. And so I say these questions more for all of us who are listening and others to think about that. What, do, what is it? Because it's so easy to just blame Ottawa. Mm. It's just a simple thing to do, right? But it's much more than that. You know, what I like about Canada is that we do have a strength in our national identity. And I would like to see us want more for our country. We are very humble, but that doesn't mean that we can't aspire highly on our ability to compete, on our ability to contribute. And we should be, we talked about, you know, Canada versus the United States and level playing fields. We should be demanding that and walk side by side with the best in the world on all of these platforms. Yeah. It's a good question around how we get there. And yet we're a country that has interprovincial trade barriers, yes. <laughs> which must affect your business too. It does indeed. And you know that the level of complexity that those kinds of barriers can bring is... is self-made, asto- by the way. Own well, goals, I call them. Own goals. <laughs> astonishing and self-made. You're yeah. right. And we need perhaps a little bit of self-help yeah. every now so and again. So it's kind of hard to go tell the others, you know, yeah. be free traders while we're not inside the country. So, okay. One of the big issues in the country, of course, is... Um, Uh, labor shortage. Uh, We have very low uh, unemployment, but we are an aging population. Where are you finding your workers and are you finding your workers? (laughs) I must tell you that in the year that I've been here, as I move across our network and meet our customers, it is one of the things that comes up every single customer, every single industry is the shortage of labor. And we would be no different. You know, it's perhaps surprised us all a little bit, but the bubble of baby boomers that we all watch move through, you know, our organizations. We don't have enough people behind that as a country, without a doubt. And we don't have enough. And we're hiring in our organization as well. And wouldn't it be a shame, absolute shame, if we slowed the economic growth of this country because we can't get enough people? It's something we need to work very hard on. It's mobilizing the workforce that we have. We have work to do on that front. Goldie, I think, you know, in... in well, foreign skills accreditation comes to mind amongst other exactly. things. Exactly. It's some of the more remote communities, and the railroads run in a lot of remote communities. It's our indigenous communities. There's still sectors of our population that we're not reaching. And it's important that we find ways to do that and find ways to do that that offer solutions to those communities and those families. Well, indigenous is the best example, right? Youngest population uh, in, in the country here, 50 And growing and fast. Growing. growing, I think, the fastest. You just need the skills. You just need the skills. And so it may not be a traditional approach to attracting this workforce. We may need to step in and, and help in different ways or step in earlier. And, you know, I think that that's the right thing for us to do. But it's also there's a business urgency around kind of getting that figured out. So there's the immigration issue that we've all talked about. This country needs to figure that out. And all of the support structure that, you know, we need as a country in order for that to work properly. But there's another piece here as well. We talked about it earlier, and that is technology. It would be a shame if we couldn't get enough people and the economy slowed and we'd failed to lean into all of the potential of technology. And so I think we need to keep that discussion going as well, not just for the new capabilities it gives, but for also of the automation capabilities that it gives us so that that workforce that we have, we can pour it in the direction of things that we can't automate, the brain power that we need, the skills that we need to lead us into, you know, the, the next way that we're going to work. Uh, so these, in my mind, are two very parallel, equally important streams of, of thought and work. 
Look, there's so many issues that we've covered here, but one I want to conclude with is, uh, you know, many of our listeners are young, aspiring leaders. Uh, you've had an interesting journey to very different uh, sectors, but but infrastructure related in, in both cases. Just just tell us a little bit about your story, your leadership story. How did you end up in this chair? Doesn't feel like a long time, but it probably would look like a long time from a lot of folks. As I told you, I grew up in a um, in a farming community in Saskatchewan. Watched the trains go by. We're reliant on the the trains as a as a farming community. And uh, so when I graduated from university, it was one of the offers I got, and it made sense to me. I liked the idea of how important the work was, and I spent my first 27 years in uh, with Canadian Pacific and had a tremendous opportunity there to work in all kinds of different places in that By the way, is this kind of like an Oilers flame switch thing or a <laughs> Leafs Canadians thing? <laughs> well, you know what? The good thing is... This country, this continent, needs both of us. Both of us, exactly. And, uh, you know, we, we are getting really good at knowing where to compete and where to, where to cooperate. And I think that's what's important. To I'm sure that in reassures Canada, our listeners. Good. In, including <laughs> us. But it's been a great journey. Uh, but lots of opportunities touch different types of places and businesses within those. But what I've become really uh, drawn to is the impact that you can have, whether you're sitting inside a railroad or whether you're sitting inside an energy infrastructure company or anything else, our ability as Canadians to step into the future is, is critical for all of us. And you know what? At the end of the day, some things that are different between companies and industries, but there's a lot that's similar when it comes to leadership. Leadership isn't really as much around um, being the smartest person in the room. It's not about being the one that knows exactly what the next step is. It's not about that. You know, so it takes you a while to learn that. But leadership is really about imagining a future and around understanding that the capability and the capacity of a team or an organization or a group of people is probably far bigger than you or they understand. And the magic in leadership is being able to open an organization up to realize exactly what they're capable of and imagine a future that is different than where we are now and finding yourselves taking steps towards it. I think that that's where I get excited about the future of companies, of industries, of people, and of Canada is when I think about what's possible. We are capable of so much, and it's our job as leaders to to imagine it. That's a great answer. I'm just going to ask, you know, you're in an industry where I think COVID would have had less of an impact on the return to work issue. How are you managing that? <laughs> so 85% of you our have a people choice, right? <laughs> got out every day and figured it out and during uh, COVID ran, too. ran trains during COVID and they figured out how to keep the economy running like all of the other essential workers did. And I'm really proud of them. And um, they're still doing it. And you know what? In a railroad, like like most essential work, we do it 24-7, regardless of the weather. No matter what it's doing, our folks get out there and they make it happen. Uh, and we all owe them a, a great deal of thanks. There are the rest of us, you know, support that effort more from office jobs. And, and you know, as I come into this company, it's been a question of whether we come back and how we come back to the office. Right now, we're back three days a week. I feel strongly about it. I think that the big challenge in front of us is we've watched the generation change. You know, we've had the great attrition of the baby boomers is how we build the next generation to step into all of these challenges. And it's really difficult to build culture, to build connectivity to build excitement and to develop to skills have relationships. to have relationships <laughs> and to understand the importance of the work that we all do when you're just talking to someone virtually thank goodness that we figured it out and how to do it and we kept everything going it's quite amazing if you think back on it but now we got to figure out how we lift out of the pandemic era and how we develop that next generation and how we get them connecting and imagining what's possible in the future and actually stepping in and making it happen. And the good news is there's so much opportunity for this next generation. I, you know, I'm excited for them and I want to be part of creating that opportunity to help them kind of step into it. Well, I asked that question because we were talking about leadership, but COVID was something, you know, no one could prepare for. Right. It, it happens once every 100 years. As a leader, what did you learn about yourself through this process? I learned, firstly, how much I need connectivity. I am impressed that we kept it all going and really impressed because I wouldn't have guessed that. When we left the office on that day in March... March 20th, I think, or yeah. something. I like really that. thought yeah, it was 13th, two weeks, or, yeah. right? I really yeah. thought it'd be a couple of weeks. Yeah. And it was years, really, before we got really, and we're still getting We're still getting out of it, it, yeah. So, it, you know, speak about resilience. 
we demonstrated that as a world, as a globe in a lot of regards. And, and that's impressive. And it gave me faith in the human, you know, the human capability, uh, which is good. I learned sitting in my den at home how much my thinking process, my creativity rests on having other people in front of me and thinking together. We learn different ways to kind of connect and do that through the virtual platforms, but there's nothing like sitting with people and thinking through things and, and creating the next idea. I want to end on a positive note in terms of uh, looking forward and optimistic. What are you most optimistic about? I choose to be optimistic. Right? It's, it's easy some days, you know, when you see how many problems and challenges there are to not be, but I think we all have to choose to be optimistic. And we are Canadian as we sit here. We talked about how lucky we are. We have this benefit of the gifts we have and natural resources and capabilities. I think we're going to figure that out. It's been challenging on infrastructure, building, operating, bringing this country, kind of keeping it moving, the economy growing. We'll figure that out because we have to figure it out. And I'm optimistic, I got to tell you, about this next generation. The challenge is significant, but great challenges is when you see when you see generations and people really step up. And, and you know, I think many of us, you, me, many of us can be part of creating those opportunities. And, and we're going to get there. And, um, you know, I wouldn't be sitting in a chair like this if I wasn't determined that, you know, we're going to get there and we're going to be part of it. Thank you for doing this. It's a pleasure. Tracy Robinson is president and CEO of CN. If you would like to hear more of our Speaking of Business conversations with innovators, leaders, and entrepreneurs, why not subscribe to our podcast? Search for Speaking of Business wherever you get your podcast, or go to our website at thebusinesscouncil.ca. Yes, thebusinesscouncil.ca. Until next time, I'm Goldie Hyder. Thank you for joining us.